Thanks, you guys. Oh, hey. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks, you guys. Oh, my gosh. Hi. Okay, I'm um, quick. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. Great. Um, I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Appreciate it. Yeah, only one person asked me. Hello? Okay, quick question. I don't know if, how many of you are from like what you would call like a big city? Make some noise. Okay, okay. How many, how many of you are from like, I'm from a small town? All right. A anyone, anyone here from like from a farm? Any farm kids? Okay. No, no, there's, there's also farm adjacent, you know? So you're kind of like, I'm not on a farm, but like, you know, you know what I mean? You're next to a farm. Anyone? Yeah, yes. So, so I grew up in a small town, just a small town girl living in a, um, and, uh, and so I got to know a lot of farm guys and farm kids, and I, I worked on a farm for a guy named Benny, Benny Flyshacker. Actually, I, I worked, it was after Benny. Benny Flyshacker was a unique guy. He was like a big guy, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, over three bills, like, you know, and uh, a really unique guy. He, um, he let people just like dump their stuff on his farmland. I don't know why, but when he died, there were over 2,000 refrigerators on his farmland. He's like, yeah, just dump it over there. There were, so one of my jobs was to get rid of the refrigerators after he died. Um, he let the people dump, dump their scrap. So one of my jobs after he died was to get rid of the scrap. Um, he had, people had to dump their, they didn't have to, they got to dump their tires on his land. So one of my summer jobs was to uh, clean up 20 tons of tires just by myself and just kind of getting those. So unique guy, but I think one of the, one of the things I love about Small town, big town, farm, farm adjacent, is how practical people can be. So my grandfather, he was a very practical guy, my dad's dad. He was so practical, so sensible, that um, almost to a fault, like you know those people who are so sensible that it's kind of like, don't even try to do anything new with me because I don't need it. So my grandpa, my dad would say, yeah, my, th that, when, that when they introduced the concept of power locks in cars, some of you remember this, others think they, didn't have power locks. My grandpa was like, nope, don't need it. He, his line was this, just one more thing that can go wrong. They introduced the idea of power windows into cars. My grandpa, he worked at the, uh, at the Ford plant in St. Paul, and so he was the fix-it guy, maintenance guy, cleanup guy, and so all these things were breaking down, so whenever he saw something new, he was just like, why? Another thing to go wrong. And so power windows, just another thing to go wrong. He actually, if I asked my dad about this, I said, Dad, did Grandpa Pete actually say this? And he said, yeah, power windows, another thing to go wrong. Power window, power locks. Now that he said, even putting a radio in a car, one more thing to go wrong. And again, I kind of like that. Like again, the farm people and very sensible people, very practical people, because it's true. Like there's a lot in life that could just go wrong. And so I think one of the things that we have is like, okay, I'm going to be sensible though. Then I'm going to be like Grandpa Pete. Then I invite y'all to be like Grandpa Pete. Just be practical, be sensible, and say, I'm just not going to expect a lot out of life because if I do, it's just another thing that can go wrong. Why? Because life is difficult. This is, this is how we're starting the talk. This is how we're starting the weekend. Hey guys, welcome to Superville West. Life is difficult <laughs> and things break, but it's true, right? I mean, how many of our lives, you think like, oh, this is what's gonna happen this summer and then it doesn't happen. Life is uncertain. Like we, I, how, many, how many of you are, are rising seniors? Uh, I can't hear you. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so. What's the number one question you get every day? Hey, what are you doing after high school? Like, that's the, and like, we don't know because the future is unknown. So, so much about life is uncertain. So much about life is difficult. So much of life is unknown. And sometimes it's hard to get your hopes up because we expect something to be the case and then it doesn't actually happen. So how many of y'all work at like the, one of those auditory responses? How many of y'all work in retail? Okay, great. So, Wow. Three of us, that's it. I, my summer job for five years, I worked on a farm for a bit. But my summer job for five years in high school, I, like my first like W or I-9 job, I, we had to fill out paperwork and pay taxes on it, was the farm thing was off the books. Don't tell anyone. But my first like summer job where I had to pay taxes was at an ice cream store, candy store, in, in downtown Nisswa, Minnesota. It's this tourist town where it's so touristy that in the winter it's closed. Like the town is closed, um, that's it. But in the summertime, all the people from the Twin Cities, they would come up to the ice cream store. And so uh, here I am, dishing up ice cream, serving up candy. And I remember, if this happens to you, if you work in retail, you know this happens. The ice cream store would close at 8 p.m. virtually every night. And at 6 p.m. it'd be dead. At 7 p.m., dead. And then at 
7.50, right? 10 minutes to close. All of a sudden, all these people are driving downtown, like families of 25 getting out of their vans and like pulling up like, are you guys, um, and I'm, I'm, here we are. It's been dead for two hours, so we're cleaning up, we're sweeping, the, we're mopping, we're getting everything ready, and we're at the door, like ready to flip the sign that says closed and lock the door and like turn off the lights. And we see this family's like, no, 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 what's happening? And they're like, are you guys still open? Yes. And it was, <laughs> and it was the most frustrating thing in the world. And the crazy thing is, if that happened once, it makes sense to be frustrated by that. You guys who work in businesses like this, does it just happen once? Does it happen all of the time? Yes, like, so, so here's, the, here's the crazy thing. I, I let that bother me every night. Who's the crazy one? I'm the crazy one. Because my expectation was, hey Mike, you're working until eight. Great, eight to one, I'm driving home. But I know that reality is not you work until eight. The reality is at 10 minutes to eight, people are gonna show up. And so you're gonna get out of, get out of there at 8.15, 8.20. And here's like, that's, that gives us a choice. Either I can embrace reality and be happy, right? Or I can hold on to expectation and then end up with frustration. Like this is, like, this is the reality of life in so many ways. I can either embrace reality, that this is how it is, or I can hang on to my expectation and be frustrated for the rest of my life. No, there's a good way to embrace reality. That's like, okay, I get it. I'm not gonna be mad at the Sidiots and the Turons who are coming to the ice cream store. I'm just gonna say this is how it is. But there's also, there's also this really strange, I say like a bad way we can embrace reality. Now, it's not embracing reality, it's this. Sometimes when our expectation and reality don't match up, we just stop expecting anything. This is something I've been praying about a lot for the last three years, because I've noticed this happen in the last three years with a lot of the high schoolers I work with, a lot of the college students I work with. In fact, in preparing for this weekend, I asked a bunch of our high schoolers, I asked a bunch of our college students that I work with, I said, hey, ever since COVID, ever since three years ago, what's, what's, what's one thing that you noticed in your life that's different? And they all said different things, but one of our young women, she said that she said, you know, I just, ever since COVID, I just, I stopped expecting too much. I just don't expect a whole lot. And everyone around this, like, the group was like, oh my gosh, yeah. And so, and so many people, they were like, until she said that, they didn't even realize they just stopped expecting. Because why? Because what happened? Okay, back in you know, 2020, um, well, I was getting ready for prom. <laughs> prom, prom's canceled. I was getting ready for my uh, state track meet. Track meet's canceled. We were rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing for, this, for the school play school play gets canceled. And then well, we're coming back, that gets canceled. Yeah, have you noticed how quick we are to cancel stuff now? I don't know if you guys noticed this because just as a culture, it's so easy like, well, I don't know, we're gonna go outside, but it might rain next week, so let's cancel today. Like it's just one of those nuts things where we just, we've stopped expecting a lot and we don't even, don't even notice it. In fact, it doesn't just, not just stop expecting, so many of us have stopped wanting anything. We just told ourselves, like, it's safer to not want anything. It's safer to not expect anything. Why? Because you want something, it's one more thing that can go wrong. You expect something, it's just one more thing that can go wrong. In fact, there's this scripture in the Old Testament. It's in 2 Kings chapter 4. No, the priests all know this one because they preached about it uh, about three weekends ago. And if you went to Mass every Sunday, which you do, I know, um, that you heard this scripture about three weeks ago. It's the story of a man named Elisha. He's a prophet. Elisha and this woman and her husband, they're from Shunem. So he, the story basically is this, that in 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha the prophet is passing through Shunem a lot, and so this woman and her husband are like, hey, you know, the prophet comes through all the time, why don't we just like make up a little studio apartment for him and you know, put a little bed, a little table, a little, you know, TV on the, on the side, a little, make up a little apartment for him so when he comes through here, he has a place to crash. So her husband says, great idea. In response, Elisha says, what is, what, he asks the woman, he says, what do you want? Is there anything you want? Her response is really fascinating because her response, well, I'll read it. <laughs> I'm gonna paraphrase the Bible for Pete's sake. You guys, you know what, if you, never mind. <laughs> I was gonna say something about if you wanna ever read the Bible. <laughs> I'll read it to you if you want. <laughs> but she said that, he says, he says, do you want anything? And her response is, well, I'm living among my own people. 
which is strange to us in the 21st century. What that means is basically her husband has been established as wealthy and she has family. So I'm good. The, Elisha, do you want anything? Just ask. I'm good. No, it could be they find out later on that she doesn't have any children. She doesn't have a son. And maybe she's at the place right now where she's like, you know, we tried and I'm not, I'm just, I'm tired of trying. So even if you're going to say, do you want anything? I'm not going to say that. Why? Because I've got enough money and I've got family here. So I'm good. I don't expect a whole lot out of life. I don't really want a whole lot out of life because it's just another thing that can go wrong. So what does Elisha say? Elisha says, well, I still want to do something for you. So he, he declares this prophetic word over her and he tells her, he says, this time next year, you'll, have, you'll be holding a baby boy in your lap. You're, you don't have any children. So this time next year, here's a great blessing for you in your life. This is a blessing that everyone in the Old Testament wants. This time next year, you'll be holding a baby boy in your lap. And her response is fascinating. Her response is, please, please go, Lord, she says. You're a man of God. Do not deceive me. Another translation is, please, my Lord, do not get my hopes up. Next year, you have a child. Don't get my hopes up. Why? Because I know reality. I know that life is difficult. I know life is so uncertain. I know there's so much unknown. I've learned not to expect anything. I've learned not to want anything. So don't get my hopes up. Because I've just given, wrong, I've given up. That might be some of us here tonight going into this weekend. I know life is difficult. You don't have to tell me that. I know life is uncertain. You don't have to tell me that. So I've just learned not to expect anything. I've learned not to want anything. Why? Because if you want something, it's just another thing that can go wrong. You know, in the New Testament, there's this fascinating uh, chapter. It's, it's chapter five of Mark's gospel. And in chapter five of Mark's gospel, there's these three different people who, if anyone should have given up, it's them. Chapter five, Mark five, talks about three people. One is a demoniac, this, this man who's been possessed by multiple demons. And it says that they've, they've tried to help him. No one can help him. They've tried to even like subdue him so he doesn't hurt himself. No one can subdue him. They've tried everything for this guy and nothing has helped. The second person is a woman who has had a hemorrhage, a flow of blood for 12 years. And it says really clearly in scripture, it says that she spent her whole savings, all, everything she had on doctors, physicians, people to take a look at her, try to heal her. And she said, and nothing helped. It only got worse. She's tried everything. If there's anyone who should give up, it would be this woman who for 12, can you imagine for 12 years, you've got a doctor after doctor after doctor. Someone says, oh, you haven't talked to Dr. So-and-so. Go see them. And you're like, okay, great. No one, one more person who might be able to help me. You try it and nope, just cost money and you're even worse than you were before. And the third person, first was the demoniac, right? Second person is this woman for 12 years, flow of blood. The third person is a guy named Jairus. And Jairus works in a synagogue. And he has a little girl, her, she's 12 years old. There's a little, little girl who is sick and she's dying. And it's the same kind of thing too. Here's Jairus who's tried everything. He's tried everything for his little girl. But he comes to Jesus. He says, Lord, if you go see her, then she'll be healed. The demoniac lets Jesus deliver him from demons. The woman who has the hemorrhage, she reaches out to trust in Jesus. She hasn't given up. Here's Jairus, who has his little girl, 12-year-old girl, who's dying, and he hasn't given up. He's still thinking, like, no, but, but Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is, can be the refuge here. Jesus can be the one who actually, it's so, it's so incredible. They reached, they tried everything, and they still reached out. They tried everything, but they didn't give up. Let's go back to ourselves. How many of us are in a place where I just, I don't know if I want to reach out. I don't know if I want to try. I, don't, I almost want to give up because it's just another thing that can go wrong. I reach out, I try. One more thing that can go wrong. In fact, it, things do go wrong. See, so when we read this 2 Kings chapter 4, the woman with Elisha and the woman of Shunem, we ended where Elisha says, hey, next year you'll be holding a baby boy. And then it says, the next year she had a baby boy. 
Great, great story, awesome story, miracle. But the story goes on from there. I don't know if you know the rest of the story. The story goes on, and it says this. It says that the next year, she had a baby boy. And it actually, scripture even, scripture even says, and he was healthy. Awesome. And the boy grew. But it went on to say, the day came when the child was old enough to go out with his father among the reapers in, into the field with his dad. So he's about four or five years old now. So he's healthy, four or five-year-old boy. And finally, the day came when it's like, hey, son, do you want to go with dad? And just go out, work with dad in the field. Yes, absolutely. So the first day, this young boy goes out into the field with his father. It says he got out to the field and he said, my head hurts. It's really simple, just my head hurts. He complained to his father. And his dad said, well, take him back to his mother. So the servant picked him up and carried him to his mother. And he stayed with her until noon when he died in her lap. Here's this child. I didn't ask for this child. I didn't expect this child. I thought, look, listen, you asked me what I wanted. I said, I'm good. Because I know you get more, and there's one more thing that can go wrong. And now here, here is this child who is in this woman's lap. And he's just, now he's dead. In fact, the woman, she, she finds Elisha. She, she carries, the, her, she carries her, her four or five-year-old son to Elisha. And when she gets before the prophet, she says these words that are just absolutely devastating. She says to him, she says, did I ask you for a son? Did I even ask you, did I, even, did I say that I wanted a child? Did I not tell you to not get my hopes up? And now my son is dead. See, this is the thing. This is the risk. To expect anything means that our expectations can be dashed. To want anything means that we can go without. To love anything is to risk. This is the whole thing. When it comes to life, when it comes to, the, this is the reason, you guys, this is the reason why so many of us have stopped expecting things. This is the reason why so many of us have stopped desiring things. This is the reason why so many of us have stopped living the way that God wants us to live. Because to live is to risk. To have faith is to risk. To love is to risk. In fact, um, one of my buddies, his name is C.S. Lewis, he, he has this quote, he says, he says, love anything at all and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. Love anything, love anything at all and your heart will be wrung, certainly be wrung and possibly broken. He says, if you want to keep your heart intact, if you want to keep your heart unbroken, then do not give your heart to anything, not even to a pet. But keep it safe. Like, wrap it up. He says, wrap it up in a lot of little luxuries, a lot of little hobbies, a lot of other little things that you can control. He says that. He says, but, but, he says, but, that's what you can do. You, you can protect your heart like that. You can not risk, not love, and not lose. But, he says, wrapping your heart up in that casket Airless, lightless, loveless. Your heart will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. In that place of protection, your heart will not be broken. It will become unbreakable. Why? Because you love anything. It's just another thing that can go wrong. Tell God what you want. Another, another desire that can be dashed. Actually, coming before the Lord and sharing with him your heart, <laughs> being the woman who reaches out and grabs onto the tassel in Jesus' cloak to say, maybe, maybe this will heal me, is just another way that you can be disappointed. Jairus coming to Jesus and saying, please, go see my daughter. It's just, an, it's just another way that his heart can be broken. But here's the crazy thing. In this world of trouble, Jesus is our refuge. Like if we want to be people who actually know how to live, if we want to be people of faith, if we want to be people who know how to love, in this world, Jesus is our refuge, which means we have to risk. Because in this world, 
Jesus doesn't take us out of this world. And Jesus doesn't take the pain away. What we mean when we say Jesus is our refuge, what we mean is that he's there in the mess. That Jesus is there in the brokenness. Jesus is there in the pain. That Jesus is there in the reality. And here's the thing. Here's one of the things that Jesus has done. He steps into our world and he tells us, life is worth the risk. That love is worth the risk. That if you're going to believe, you're going to belong to him. That it, that it actually is ultimately worth the risk. You know, it's, it's fascinating. The story is that uh, the demoniac, he gets delivered from demons, right? He shows up, they call out to him, and Jesus delivers. The woman, she reaches out, 12 years, she reaches out, touches the hem of his cloak, she's healed. Of course, Jairus, the 12-year-old girl, he shows up, Jesus shows up, and the little girl is dead. But Jesus steps in there and he says, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. Even more, in 2 Kings 4, the woman brings this four-year-old, five-year-old boy to Elisha. And Elisha spreads himself out over the boy and he breathes in him and brings the little boy back to life. No, these are, these are all stories of like, well, miracle of demonic possession, done, you know, gone by demons. Um, here's a, the flow of blood healed. Here's a little boy, little girl, both of them brought back to life. And you might hear these stories. We might hear these stories and say, well, great. I'm glad, happy for you. I'm glad you got what you wanted. Sometimes that's how we respond, right? Like, oh, I'm glad you got what you prayed for. Someone so got healed. Well, you know what? I didn't get healed. It's easy for you when you get what you want. That can be our temptation. To think, oh, it's easy for you to risk now because you got what you wanted. It's easy for you to love now because you got what you wanted. I say that's not true. Whether we get what we want or don't get what we want, life is going to be about risk. Faith is going to be about risk. Life is going to demand courage. Imagine, imagine. Here's Jairus, his 12-year-old girl. He, he knows what it's like to love his 12-year-old daughter and have her die. Yeah, she's back, but like, I don't know if I want to give her my heart. Here's this mom. I never asked for a child, but now I have this child and my heart has been completely broken. Now, here's your child. He's alive again, but she knows. I have a choice. Will I protect my heart and keep him at arm's length or will I love him again? You know, my grandpa Pete, very sensible guy, practical guy, said, why have, why have extra stuff? Just one more thing that can go wrong. It makes sense that he would say that. So he and my grandma Lucy, my, my dad is their 14th child. My grandpa Pete and my grandma Lucy had 14 kids. My dad is the 14th child, but my dad is the only one who lived. 13 children in a row. They had miscarriages. They had stillbirths. They had a couple children who were born alive and then died within days of birth. Here's my dad, the 14th one. And again, you could say that like, wow, we finally have a child. We finally have a son. We finally have the thing we were hoping for. My grandma, her response to, to this, her response to have lo losing, losing 13 children. Can you imagine what that would do to your heart? My grandma apparently was very protective of my father, which makes sense, right? Super protective of this. I had 14 kids. Here's the one who's alive. She's going to be pretty protective of my grandpa. He, did the, he went the opposite way. He goes, here, do you finally have a son? You finally have a child? My grandpa was kind of like, yeah, we're gonna, we're not gonna get close to this one. Because I know what happened to the other 13 children that my wife had. Because to have faith requires courage. To love requires courage. To live in this world requires courage. And this is the last thing. You might know of a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Does anyone know about a man named Alexander Solzhenitsyn? The priests do. Yes, great. <laughs> Youth ministry. So Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he, uh, at one point, he was placed in a Soviet communist gulag in Soviet Russia. 
And in this gulag, think of being sent to Siberia, living in a concentration camp. That's where Alexander Solzhenitsyn was sent. He was sent there because he spoke out, spoke truth. And he wrote, wrote about the evils of communism, the evils of socialism. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, at one point, he was set free from the gulag, and he, had, he was sent away from the Soviet Union. And he came to the United States. I remember the first time I came in contact with Alexander Solzhenitsyn, it was a speech that he had given, I think it was the Harvard graduating class commencement address in like 1960 or 1978, something like this. And everyone was so excited to hear from this man who was like, he, he lived through all this stuff. Like he lived through incredible things and he, he got, to, he was gonna talk about how the, you know, the evils of communism, the evils of socialism, the evils of all these Marxism, this kind of thing. And he came to Harvard and instead of talking about how amazing the West is, how amazing this country, this whole like, our culture is, he said, he said, yeah, you have a lot of incredible things in your culture. This country is amazing. The United States is amazing. He says, but you lack something that is absolutely necessary. He said, what I, what I see you lacking, you have so much abundance, you have so much around you, you guys, we have so much capacity, you have so much ability. He says, but you have a country, a culture that has so much ability, so much capacity, you could do so much, but you lack this thing. He says, you lack courage. If there's anything that will hold you back as a country, if there's anything that will hold you back as a culture, is you lack courage. Because you've stopped expecting. You've stopped trying. You've stopped trusting. And ultimately, he said, it's because you don't have Jesus anymore. Because this world is going to be difficult. And so we don't like rely on our own strength. We don't rely on like, I'm going to be Rambo. I'm going to be super strong. I'm going to go out and do the thing. It's like, no, no. Why would you have courage in a world where things break? Because of Jesus. Why would you risk loving in a world where people die? Because you have Jesus. Why would you risk having faith and trusting in God in a world where we can expect something and not get it. Because you have Jesus. Why will we choose to love in a world where there's so much good stuff, but there's just a lot of good stuff that can go wrong? Just another thing that can break. Just another thing that can end. We have the courage to live and love and have faith for one reason, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, because we have Jesus and he is our refuge. So in this moment, we just realize I may have stopped expecting much out of life. I may have stopped desiring. I may have stopped asking God to show up. But tonight, have courage. Tonight, risk. Tonight, be brave. Because Jesus is our refuge.